greyhounds in the slips, training upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry! England and St. Those are some of the most famous words from Shakespeare, but who exactly was St. George? Was the patron saint of the English really a white, well-coiffed, sometimes effeminate medieval knight? If so, then why did this man, the Duke of Modena, in the 1400s commission St. George to be painted like this, a black man? Was the Duke misinformed, insane, or worse, an Afrocentrist? Was St. George even a verifiable historical figure? If so, is it possible that he too was just another victim of historical whitewashing, a casualty of Western cultural theft, like a host of other famous figures from history and mythology? For answers, we have to go here, Leda, or as it's called today, Lod, a city 15 kilometers southeast of Tel Aviv, Israel because in actual fact, St. George didn't come from anywhere remotely like medieval England. How do we know this? Well, the earliest biographical accounts we have of him all unanimously state that he was from Roman era Palestine or born to a Palestinian woman living in Diospolis, the Hellenistic moniker for the city of Lydda. George's father is said to have been a high-born Greek from Cappadocia modern-day Anatolia in Turkey. So how does George, son of a Palestinian woman and a Greek nobleman, become what the authors of this ancient text, Acta Sanctorum, called Toto Cristiano Orbe Celebraimi Memoriam, the most illustrious saint in Christendom? To begin, the earliest accounts say nothing about George slaying a dragon. Instead, they speak of his defiance of this man. Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian became co-emperor of Rome in 284 AD and was a proponent of the old ways amidst the people fast losing their religion. Diocletian saw himself as a type of Jupiter, head of the Roman pantheon, and wished to restore traditional Roman religion and schools of thought. There was only one problem, Christianity. The new religion was on the rise in all quarters of the empire and Diocletian's pagan renaissance was finding it hard to compete. And so in 303 AD, the Diocletian persecution of Christians began. Diocletian's ire against Christianity was particularly drawn against the Darians serving in the Roman army, and so he sought to eliminate them from his forces also. Enter George of Lydda, who at this time was in his late twenties and had risen through the army's ranks to become an officer, charged with the personal protection of Emperor Diocletian, according to some accounts. George was also one of the officers tasked with executing the state's order of rooting out Christians from the army. Instead, he confessed to being a Christian himself. After being granted an audience with Diocletian, George proceeded to denounce the emperor to his face. Embarrassed and furious, Diocletian promptly ordered the arrest of this apparent traitor. George was tortured by laceration on a wheel of swords, dragged through the city streets by horses, and executed by decapitation in Lydda, where he is said to be buried to this day. A pretty grim end for a brave man, by all accounts. The earliest accounts, that is. Later retellings decide to add to this story. See if you can spot anything strange happening as the story changes. A Syriac document transforms St. George's antagonist from the Roman Emperor Diocletian to the Persian Emperor Dacian. Also in this version, George is no longer from Palestine, next door to Egypt and wider Africa, but is now decidedly more European in that he is said to hail from his father's region of Cappadocia, today part of Arabized Turkey but back then firmly within the Hellenistic Byzantine world. Not content with this, the crafters of the new Georgian story now say 
that he wasn't beheaded in Palestine, but in Nicodemia, again, a Greek city. Notice anything yet? Already as early as the 6th century, only a couple hundred years after the likely existence of a protesting Palestinian officer in the Roman army named George, he is now being positioned as a European fighting against the pagan other as opposed to being a man firmly rooted in a part of the world where you're more likely to find darker skinned people being the main character in their own stories. But it's around the time of the Crusades that the story of George takes a dramatic twist into the well even more dramatic. European soldiers fighting in Palestine alongside mercenary and Christian Moors, black soldiers from the north and east of Africa return with stories of St. George rescuing a princess from a dragon in Silene, Libya, killing the dragon and converting the king and inhabitants of the city to Christianity. You might think this is just a rehashing of the Greek story of Perseus rescuing Andromeda from the sea monster Ketos. Many do. But even that European myth owes its origins to Africa. Not only was Andromeda originally an Ethiopian princess, something Hollywood has always conveniently left out in its many reenactments, but the sea monster Ketos was likely a Nile crocodile inspired by the Egyptian myth of the hero god Horus triumphing over the crocodiles of Ipu in Upper Egypt. A combination of these ancient African myths and their future Greek versions combined to produce a Christianized version in which Saint George became a type of Christ crushing the head of the serpent Satan. Soldiers from Europe carry these stories back to their disparate countries and the legend of Saint George the Dragon Slayer is born. But the strange thing about this legend is how quickly it spreads. It reaches Western Europe properly in the 11th century and the English, along with other European countries, soon adopts the myth as a national story. Now supposed experts say the myth only reached Inner Africa, places like the Kingdom of Ethiopia, several centuries later. But considering it's a rehash of an old African myth and that the story and the individual on whom it is based both come from a region infinitely closer to Africa than the green fields of England, most likely this is just another example of anti-black European chauvinism designed either consciously or subconsciously to keep Africans once again at the back of the historical bus. Proponents of this bizarre view base their opinion on the fact that there are no extant Ethiopic documents on St. George earlier than the 15th century. But this hardly surprises, for while England and its monasteries were largely safe from the ravages of Muslim Moors, Arab conqueror Mohammed Gran was busy ravaging Ethiopia in 1540, destroying countless swathes of churches, libraries and monasteries from Ethiopia's brilliant Aksumite period. Then there are these, the extraordinary church of Laribella hewn from solid rock in honour of St. George by Ethiopian Emperor Gabriel Meskel Laribella, built in the 12th century and not in the 15th century. But apart from all this, what evidence is there that the person we know as St. George could have been a man of African extraction and not, well, this? Here's where things get very interesting and depending on who you are, perhaps just a little too hard to believe. We don't have to go on a balance of probabilities or guesswork, we can turn, as many decipherers of the past have done, to historical iconography. See, a curious thing happens the further back in time you go looking for representations of St. George. Dig back deeper and deeper in time and the darker the image of St. George becomes. Not metaphorically, literally. Rewind the clock on all of these more recent depictions and St. George becomes what can only be described by the unblinked observer as a black man. Recently, a church in Australia marking St. George's Day depicted him as something of a matted hair, green-eyed Italian. In 1890, Gustave Moreau decided he had long blonde hair with his very unlibyan looking prize striking an oddly calm pose on some spiky looking rocks in the background. 33 years earlier, manliness was clearly the order of the day and so we get a painting of George 
embracing his Libyan bride at his own wedding by pre-Raphaelite painter Dante Rossetti. Rossetti fits St. George with flowing red hair, a rugged beard and a somber look. But skip back a few centuries and nothing has changed significantly except that back then, Europeans had a preference for seeing their saints being received up to heaven, half naked and dangerously resembling Russell Brand? In 1560, namesake Giorgio Vasari depicts George's slaying of the dragon in this heavily romanticized way. In 1510, a man called Hans von Kulumbach paints him this way, with George's dragon posing about as much of a threat as a famous Great Dane begging for his eponymous Scooby Snacks. But it isn't until the 1400s, 300 years after St. George's myth is supposed to have taken root in Western Europe, that we get this painting, commissioned by Borso d'Este, Duke of Ferrara and later Modeno. Its subtle realism pulls you in immediately. St. George isn't striking a romantic pose for a gallery audience. Rather, he's engrossed wholly in destroying an agile, winged beast. His armor is bright red, like many a samurai's, and quite like samurai armor, his seems to flow naturally with his movements, allowing for what looks like a fluid motion captured in time. But what's this? George's face, unanimated and stoic, is that of a black man. And without the cartoonish features many Europeans would later become accustomed to, but why? Why does an Italian duke decide to have George painted this way by his artist ward Cosimo Tura? Is this all just artistic license? A whimsical attempt to reimagine St. George in more exotic terms? Or is something else afoot? To get an answer, you must first see this. A similar, more popularized version of Cosimo Tura's St. George and the Dragon. The main difference between this and the other Tura work hardly needs pointing out. But why the difference? Why is this George Caucasian and the other a black man? And how did this come to be the more popularized work? Without the power to raise the dead and ask all parties involved, nobody can say for sure. We can only guess. This is our guess. The truth of the matter might lie in the era during which Cosimo Tura was working in. As early as 1440, the first wave of West African slaves were being trafficked to Europe by the Portuguese and Spanish. Before there was a transatlantic slave trade, there was an intra-Atlantic slave trade. By 1460, almost a thousand blacks had already made their way to Portugal aboard slave ships, and in the next 50 years, several tens of thousands would follow. After ridding itself of the Muslim blackamoors who came from North and West Africa, it seemed the writing was on the wall for Europe's future relations with Africans. Malice, revenge and self-imposed amnesia. Renaissance Europe was ostensibly based on the high morals of Christianity, but with this identity came a crisis. It's hard to kill and enslave those who your foundational system of morality declares to be just as human and worthy of dignity as you are. You have to create a parallel narrative, and that narrative had no time for the dignified Negro, a people whose history was said by the first Egyptologists to be older and grander than the Europeans. And so the efforts to expunge any idea of the Negro as a full human being with valid contributions to history, culture, and human advancement was underway. Records were suppressed, art was mothballed, reconstructions commissioned. A collective amnesia took over Europe from around the closing of the Middle Ages in the latter half of the 1400s and it remains till pretty much today. The image of the African with agency and destiny was changed for one that at best needed the European to be whole. Cosimo Tura's Black St. George seems to have been another victim of the white man's deliberate forgetfulness. It certainly isn't the only depiction we have to go on in piecing together St. George's true identity. Pre-1460, you are likely to get many images of a Black St. George. 
This image is from the early 15th century and it's a Russian Orthodox Church's depiction. It shows George on horseback lancing the dragon and whichever way you light the canvas, the distinct black or deep brown skin tone of the character portrayed is undeniable. Note also that what is later made ambivalent by European artists when they choose to show a round-haired, curly-haired, blonde man is not left to interpretation in this medieval Russian painting. Unless you wish to be obtuse, George is clearly a man sporting what we colloquially refer to today as an afro. Admittedly, his look is that of a nilotic East African man. Nevertheless, the idea that you are looking at anything other than an African man in this painting is untenable. You might object that many of the Russian Orthodox Church's paintings of dark-hued individuals weren't necessarily of black people and that this is merely the Russian Church's obsession with far-off and exotic lands coming through. But is that also the rationale behind this gold plaque, this time done by the people of Georgia and dating back to the early 1400s. Once again, you can note the deliberate deep brown of St. George's skin tone, an undeniable contrast to the images of George that come later. It's important to note that Georgia borders Turkey, supposedly the scene of some of George's early life. Georgia itself is so named due to how firmly the cult of St. George took root in the region. It's an irony then that cannot go unremarked upon that a country boasting the Caucasus mountain range, where anthropologically speaking, Europeans are said to have migrated out from, is named after an individual whose original depictions couldn't have been less Caucasian. Here's another rendition of St. George from 15th century Georgia. Once again, his short black afro is present, while his princess is noticeably of lighter hue but not altogether outside the somatic range common among East African men and women. Still, these black depictions of St. George don't end here. This is a much earlier 12th century Byzantine medallion with St. George's semblance painted and engraved onto it. His gregarious, kinky jet black hair remains. His skin coloration is still what the unbiased observer would consider African as he looks sideways as if to ask how his ethnicity could even be doubted. And yet, none of these are the most conclusive of portrayals of George. We can go back even further and find even more damning pieces of evidence confessing to the whitewashing of George's original identity. Here is an 11th century plaque of St. George in the Vatopedi Monastery in Greece. Admittedly, not much can be made of skin tone where there is none. But what of his hair? Again, George's natural halo, his bolshy afro, remains. Yes, his nose is aquiline, but this is not divorced from what an East African Oromo or Amharan man might look like. St. George's nose is certainly no less aquiline than it is in this medieval Ethiopian work. Nobody would deny this to be the face of an African warrior triumphing over the dragon, thinnish nose notwithstanding. And then there's this representation from a Russian Orthodox Church dating back to the 17th century. Not as far back as the 11th century, but take a closer look and you can hardly call this your average Russian face. It becomes a redundant exercise after a while. Suffice to say, those who wish to deny the evidence of their eyes will do so regardless. It only remains to unveil one last series of images. St. George was perhaps the most revered non-biblical saint in early Christianity. As stated earlier, there are countries named after him. He is the patron saint of several European nations and of modern-day Ethiopia. But more to the point, Coins with his likeness were minted as far back as the 1100s, and all of them without exception show the face of a black man. This is a coin minted during the reign of Alexius III Angelus Comnenus, around the late 1100s. On the obverse is St. George with tight ringleted hair, pronounced prognathus and thick lips. Beardless, he holds his famous spear in his right hand, then there's this coin, 
showing the face of the Byzantine Emperor Manuel I Komnenos, who reigned from 1143 to 1180. His features, thin nose, thin lips, bearded jaw and flowing braided hair strike a marked contrast to the obverse where we see St. George full-lipped, a wide nose and tightly curled afro hair. There are many more variations of this same coin and others like it from the 12th century and they all unanimously show the face of an African. So what? The nervous observer might say. Isn't all of this moot anyway considering St. George came from Palestine and not Africa? The fact that this question can even be asked is proof of a job well done by Western pseudo-intellectuals who have succeeded in boxing black history into a restrictive time and place. Newsflash, Palestine is not geographically removed from Africa. To those who tout the Sahara as an impassable barrier between black Africa and the rest of the world, you're wrong. It never was. But even if it were, you don't need to cross the Sahara to reach Palestine from Africa. Ships and boats have crossed the Red Sea from Africa's eastern frontier since time immemorial. But only in recent history, post the rise of pseudo-academic white and Arab dogma, has it been seriously suggested that the black presence across North Africa and on stretches of earth adjoining the African continent were never occupied by free blacks. If such a self-serving assertion is ignored, then it wouldn't be so surprising that even if St. George's father were Greek, his mother was obviously a black inhabitant of Palestine, making George at the most conservative estimation an African of mixed genetic heritage. Nevertheless, even with all that said, looking at these early images of St. George, it shouldn't surprise us if both parents were black. Ancient peoples didn't carry around passports detailing their ethnicity. They weren't as obsessed with race as a European world would later become. So that if a person was culturally Greek, this did not speak to their ethnic origin. They were simply accepted as Greek, Roman and so on. That is to say, George's father could well have been black and Greek. Others have suggested that ancient Mediterranean Europe was far more diverse than we have been led to believe and certainly more diverse than Egyptologists have painted the ancient Egyptians to be. For example, when Pliny the Elder speaks of an Egyptian tribe known for wrestling with and taming the Nile crocodile, he doesn't bother to describe their ethnic features. He takes it for granted that his readership understands that the typical Egyptian is as Herodotus termed them, quote, black-skinned with woolly hair. Only when you choose to ignore the surplus evidence from antiquity and assume that the ancient Egyptians were anything but black are you surprised by images from the ancient past such as these. When Herodotus himself speaks of other North Africans such as the original indigenous Libyans, he includes lighter skin types as well as a dominant warrior class he classifies and terms as Ethiopians. And as for Palestine specifically, a recent study said this of the earliest inhabitants of the region, a people known as Natufians. Quote, Cranial metric analyses have suggested an affinity between the Natufians and populations of North or Sub-Saharan Africa, a result that finds some support from Y-chromosome analysis which shows that the Natufians and successor Levantine Neolithic populations carried haplogroup E of likely ultimate African origin. You put all this together and these old paintings, rather than something to explain away, suddenly become testament to a forgotten past. A past they would rather the world forgot. A black past. Who would have thought it, eh? The patron saint of the English. A black man. Thanks for watching to the end. If you've learned something from this video and like our work, then consider subscribing for more amazing exposés of suppressed black history. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and please feel free to share this video far and wide. Special thanks and shout out for the production of this video goes out to Black Rampage 2 and African Art Legacy. 
If you also would like to help in the future production of our videos, then go ahead and check out our membership page. From Kush all the way to Compton, we are Trail Black, no doubt.